Hi, I'm Mrs. Sin. I'm going to be reading chapter 25 in One Crazy Summer. Wish We Had a Camera Once we arrived in San Francisco, Fern stopped singing, I saw something, and we stopped asking her to tell us what she had seen. We got off the bus and were greeted by hippies hanging out by the bus stop. It wasn't right to stare at them like they were in an exhibit, but we couldn't help it. We didn't see many hippies in Brooklyn, not where we lived, and there was a whole tribe of them before us. All kinds of mostly white hippies with long, hanging hair. You couldn't miss the guy in the green, red, and white Mexican poncho, or the moppy hair covering his face. I'd have called it an afro, except it was on a white guy's head. I wondered if that made a difference. The hippies sat on the grass. One read a small book. Three girls swayed while Poncho Man played his guitar. They must have been out protesting and were done for the day. Their signs lay in the grass. Peace. Ban the draft. Make love, not war. I wish we had a camera. Peace, sweet soul sisters. Poncho Man dipped his head, as if pointing to his open guitar case. I don't know what made me say it, but instead of groovy man or peace, I said, power to the people. Then Bonetta said, free Huey. And Fern said, yeah, free Huey Newton. That was when we met her, the flower girl. We had finally seen one. There were all kinds of songs on the radio about hippie girls with flowers in their hair. She had daisies in her hair, and she drifted over to us, her eyes all dreamy as she danced in her flowing paint-splattered dress. She took a daisy from her hair and gave it to Fern. Then she had to give one to Vanetta, because Vanetta wasn't about to be overlooked. Peace is power, sweet soul sisters. I wanted to crack up, but saved that for later. We took the flowers and dropped two nickels and five pennies in Poncho Man's guitar case. Even though I could have figured it out, I asked him where Grant Street was, and he pointed east. We gave the hippies the peace sign and the power sign and walked over to Grant Street. We were excited by the sight of the metal rails in the street. The cable car was second on my list of activities. Our first activity was sightseeing in Chinatown. You know you're in Chinatown. The buildings are just like they are in China. That's a temple, I told my sisters. I had seen the pictures in National Geographic magazine and in the encyclopedia. Nothing compared to actually seeing the roofs, like tiled lampshades or hats. Dragons of every color, gold, red, blue, green, pink, big heads with large fangs, big eyes, monstrous paws. We needed a camera. We shared a plate of dumplings and drank free tea. None of us could keep the dumplings between the chopsticks, so we used forks. After that, we found a place where all they did was make fortune cookies. They let us come in and watch the ladies slip fortunes inside flat yellow cookie dough, then fold the dough over. We bought ten fortune cookies for a dollar. Our first fortune said, You will travel far. I said, We already did. Still, I put each pink and white strip of paper in my shoulder bag as souvenirs. Now we could say we had real Chinese fortune cookies in Chinatown. We gawked at all the window offerings, green statues that I learned were carved of jade, china dolls, fans, silk and satin dresses with Nehru collars. I almost felt bad about not having more money to spend. I want a kimono, Vonetta declared. Me too. A blue one, Fern said. A kimono is Japanese, I said, as if I knew the difference. And we're in Chinatown. It's the same thing, Vonetta said, and I want one. It is not, I told her, and we have five dollars exactly for souvenirs, so you're out of luck. While we were arguing about what was Chinese and what was Japanese, I noticed this family of five tall blonde people standing near us. I didn't eyeball them dead on, but I knew they were staring at us. My heart thumped fast. It was happening. That bad thing that happened to kids when they went out on excursions without their mother. I tried to shush Vanetta, who thought she was winning our disagreement. I had to get my sisters away from these starers. And then, what would I tell the police when they ask about our mother? We were cooked. When I turned... I found the five people smiling at us. Their faces made long by high cheekbones and long white teeth. They waved. I'd seen white people before, on TV, at school, everywhere. 
These people didn't look like any white people I had ever seen. Even their skin was paler, their hair more white than yellow. I listened as they spoke to one another, probably about us, using frugal, shrugal words. Then, instead of taking pictures of all the Chinese people and the temples and dragons, they pointed their cameras at us. Vanetta started to pose movie star style, with one hand behind her head and the other on her slim hip. I grabbed Vanetta's and Fern's hands and said, Come on! I checked my Timex. It was almost one o'clock. That meant our time in Chinatown was up, and we had to go on to our next activity, a ride on the cable car. We dashed over to where the metal rails ran along the street and waited. Sure enough, at one o'clock, on the nose, we were on to our next activity. A cable car ride from the tip-top of Chinatown all the way down to Fisherman's Wharf. We climbed aboard and I paid our fare. We stood because standing would be more fun going down that hill. And what a hill it was! It was a thrilling look down, down, down. The streets rolled like a dancing dragon. Hiro Hirohito didn't know the first thing about a hill. We needed a camera to get this hill. How steep, how long. We rode it all the way down to the wharf, cheering with every clang of the bell. We were now near the wharf. There were palm trees, real palm trees, with sturdy trunks. Down here, palm trees made sense. They stood as palm trees were supposed to stand, reaching up to the sun, branches spread out wide, not like a sickly child, too small and slouched over to, in someone's yard back in Oakland. When we got off, we could see the Golden Gate Bridge perfectly well, but we took turns looking through the telescope right there on the walkway, gazing out to the bridge. I felt what I almost felt on the airplane. It was the pure excitement of seeing the world. Even the seagulls were sea gullier than the ones that flew and squawked around Coney Island. These wide-winged birds seemed bigger and majestic, both close up and far away. Or maybe it was that you could see and smell the ocean and the tar, salt, and wood from the wharf. I breathed in deep to get it all. Too bad there was no way to capture the wharf smell in a jar to take with me. For a minute, I forgot I was with my sisters. Then I remembered what Papa had said and I stopped myself from falling into the whiff of salt air and flying off with the seagulls, like some dreamy flower girl. I was happy to be there, and that had to be good enough. There was no need to get glaze-eyed and forgetful. We stopped in a gift shop on the wharf. The man behind the counter set his eyes on us real hard. At first I thought it was because we were by ourselves, so I whispered to Vanetta and Fern to be extra well-behaved. But then I heard Cecile's last words in my head. His hard stare was for the other reason store clerk's eyes never let up. We were black kids, and he expected us to be in his gift shop to steal. When he asked us what we wanted, I answered him like I was at the center, repeating after Sister Mukumba or Sister Pat, We are citizens, and we demand respect. I grabbed Fern by the hand and said, Let's go. I had that Black Panther stuff in me and it was pouring out at every turn. I figured it was all right. Papa wouldn't wanted me to spend our money where we weren't treated with respect, but I was sure Big Ma would have wanted us to say, yes, sir, and please, sir, to show him we were just as civilized as everyone else. We walked farther down the wharf and found an old lady with a wooden cart to buy our souvenirs from. She carried mostly postcards, silver spoons, thimbles, and tiny drinking glasses that said, Welcome to San Francisco. Her cart wasn't as nice as the gift shop, but she was toothless and happy to get our nickels and dimes. Since we didn't have a camera, I thought buying ten postcards for fifty cents would be the next best thing. I told my sisters each to pick out three postcards, one to keep as a reminder of our San Francisco excursion, one to mail to Pa and Big Ma, and one to send to Uncle Darnell in Vietnam. I'd figure out what we'd do with the leftover postcard. At least now we finally had something to show for flying all the way to California. We took the cable car to the bus stop and took the East Bay bus back to Oakland. We talked and talked about all the things we had seen and the hippies and the tall bl blonde white people and the red and golden dragons and the steep hills and the cable cars and seagulls and dumplings and everything. Wouldn't Cecile be surprised when we told her where we went? 
Then I felt bad because we didn't get her anything from the souvenir card. I hadn't thought of her at all, and the guilt began to have its way with me. I told my sisters, We're selfish. We didn't buy anything for, for Cecile. Before we got too quiet, stewing in our own selfishness, Vanetta said, She wouldn't want it anyway. Good old Vanetta. Fern and I agreed with her. Surely wouldn't. In a way, I was glad to be back in Black Oakland, the sun still shining. As much as I loved our adventure, I was always on the lookout, in between, just looking. Here I knew where everything was. The center, the park, the library, the city pool, Safeway, and mean Lady Mings. No one stared unless they were staring because they didn't like your shoes or your hairstyle, not because you were black or they thought you were stealing. As much as we needed to go off and have our California adventure, it was nice to be back, even if it wasn't our real home. I still carried my shoulder bag, Brooklyn style, but it was now lighter and I wasn't worried. We stopped inside Mean Lady Ming's and gave her all the change we had left except for two dollar bills. What can we get with this? Mean Lady Ming yelled something mean back to the kitchen, and in ten minutes we had a brown bag smelling of fried rice and chicken wings. I figured out one day of take food I figured one day of take out food wouldn't hurt anything, but honestly, I was too tired and happy to cook. I was anxious to tell Cecile all about our vacation day. I wanted to show off how well I had planned everything down to the minute, that I knew what to do, and I wanted to see if she cared. We were a block away from the green stucco house, chatting and laughing. Then we stopped walking, all three of us. There were three police cars parked outside of Cecile's house, one in the driveway and two along the curb. Policemen lined the walk. Lights flashed on top of their cars onto the street. Red, white, and blue lights everywhere. We inched up. The happiness knocked out of us. Cecile and two black panthers, hands behind their backs, handcuffed, being led out of the house and down the walkway. I could hardly breathe. 